Good evening, everyone. And we are speaking to all of you in the auditorium. And a lot of people who weren't able to take seats are in the back. And I want to assure you all that this is being recorded and it will be available online. So if you're not in the best position to hear where you are in the space, you'll be able to um, access what you're hearing tonight. I'm Marla Burns, the Shirley and Ralph Shapiro Director of the Fowler Museum, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this very special program on a very special occasion of the 25th anniversary of the U University of California Humanities Research Institute. And so I think we should begin with a round of applause for the Institute and the great work that it does. The Fowler has had a long and very productive relationship with the Institute, and we've worked closely with its director, David Theo Goldberg, members of its board, and its terrific staff. And so we're very happy about this evening's event, and we look forward to many in the next 25 years of the Institute's history. This panel discussion on race, representation, and re repression was conceived jointly to complement the Fowler Museum's exhibition upstairs, Ernest Cole Photographer. And I'm fairly certain that many of you have not yet had a chance to see the exhibition. I encourage all of you to take the opportunity to see it when you can. The Fowler is open Wednesday through Sunday. It's a very, very important project of the work of one of South Africa's first black photojournalists who documented the years of apartheid, the early years from 1958 to 1966. He pursued his project with unflinching honesty and tremendous bravery and ended up in a life of exile outside of South Africa. The photographs tell a moving and powerful story, but they also reveal an artist who had an incredible eye and compositional um, acumen. So please take a chance to see this exhibition when you can. And I would also like to say that this is the first retrospective of Ernest Cole's work in the United States, and we are the first museum to be showing it. It was organized by the Hasselblad Foundation in Sweden, which is the holder of uh, Cole's archives, and it was curated by one of its long-term staff members who spent years uncovering every inch of Ernest Cole's life, and her name is Gunilla Kanape. I would also like to urge all of you to see a small exhibition that we organized to complement Ernest Cole Photographer called Mandela for President, South Africa Votes for Democracy. This was organized for us by Betsy Quick, our Director of Education and Curatorial Affairs. It's based on a wonderful collection of ephemera the Fowler has documenting that momentous event of the first democratic election in South Africa. And it provides us with a bit of a triumphant coda to a very moving and disturbing story in the Ernest Cole Gallery. So please pick up programs as you leave because there are a lot of other things that we've organized in conjunction with these exhibitions. And so that is my little piece of promotion for the Fowler and to get all of you to come back. And with this as a bit of a welcome and an introduction, I'd now like to introduce David Marshall, the Michael Douglas Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts at UC Santa Barbara, who is also the chair of the Humanities Advisory Committee, which oversees the UC Humanities Network. And I might add, he was my boss for several years when I was at UC Santa Barbara. So please welcome Dean David Marshall. Actually, wasn't really your boss, but I'm glad you thought so. Uh, I'm very glad to offer a few uh, words of welcome on behalf of the UC Humanities Network, and I'd like to thank our colleagues at UCLA and particularly Marla Burns and the Fowler Museum uh, for this wonderful opportunity uh, to be here uh, to celebrate the 25th 
anniversary of the UC Humanities Initiative and also concurrently to have the annual meeting of our uh, UC Society of um, Fellows. It is a wonderful exhibit and it's great to be able to do this programming in conjunction with it. Uh, the UC Humanities Initiative was launched in 19... 87 by then UC President David Gardner. And this was a transformational presidential initiative that was designed to support and strengthen research in the humanities across the University of California system. It supported faculty and graduate student fellowships. It established humanities centers on each campus and it created the UC system-wide humanities research institute, UCHRI, which is based at UC Irvine. The humanities initiative has been recognized nationally for the conceptual brilliance of its configuration of support for graduate students, junior and senior faculty, collaborative research, and interdisciplinary programs that have contributed to individual campuses, to the entire University of California, but also to the academy at large. In 2009, the Humanities Initiative was reinvented as the UC Humanities Network, linking three related elements, the UC Society of Fellows in the Humanities, a multi-tiered program of research fellowships, the UC Consortium of Humanities Centers, a system-wide network of humanities centers and multi-campus research groups, and the nationally renowned UC Humanities Research Institute. Our fellowship programs have led to hundreds of important publications, um, books and articles that have won prizes and shaped the fields uh, in which they have published. The integrated programs of the initiative and the network have played a central role in the development of the vital interdisciplinary and uh, collaborative research culture that has transformed American university campuses in the last 25 years. And as you can tell from this weekend, these programs include public programming with dynamic public humanities series that are vital to our mission as a public university. In our multicultural and multilingual global society, which really is exemplified by California today, we need citizens who will understand the languages and cultures of other traditions. Global challenges, as well as our increasing cultural diversity at home, necessitate the knowledge of the past and the comparative methods of interpretation, the acts of cultural translation that the humanities can teach us. Today, debates about medical research, new technology, uh, educational policy, human rights, poverty, violence, the environment, the meaning of citizenship, all demand an ability to think critically and think creatively, to make informed ethical choices, and to understand the philosophical and moral stakes in the decisions that we make and the decisions that we don't make. Both research and teaching in the humanities are crucial to our ability not only to understand, but also to innovate, to reinvent our culture and our society in the 21st century. Well, now it's my privilege to introduce David Theo Goldberg, who is director of the UC Humanities Research Institute. So thank you and welcome. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here and to see the sea of faces uh, before one. One always sort of um, takes a breath before an event like this opens. And uh, just to see so many people interested in uh, the program to follow is uh, really quite affirming. So uh, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your evening on this beautiful Southern California evening. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, uh, our speakers who have come uh, from near and far to be with us uh, and from whom we will no doubt uh, learn a great deal tonight. Um, if David Marshall isn't the boss of all of us, uh, he's certainly our guiding hand and has brought us to this point of uh, you know, being able to celebrate our 25th anniversary, uh, both as an institute and as the collective uh, initiative across the University of California. I want to add my thanks uh, to the Fowler uh, Museum under the terrific direction uh, of Marla Burns, who I should add was once 
uh, the chair of the Board of Governors of UCHRI and with whom we've done repeatedly uh, a number of really terrific um, engagements and events uh, pretty much like this, one on Haiti, uh, another one on uh, the history of surfing with Michael Oblovitz, an old friend who's in the audience, uh, and so on. So it has really been uh, an enormous pleasure to uh, be able to work with her again, and I do look forward to another 25 years of engaging each other, even as we dodder along into our, <laughs> our old age. Um, I, w I just want to add my thanks also to your staff who have been fabulous to work with, uh, um, to uh, obviously to the University of California and the Office of the President uh, that has supported us, to the local Dean's Office at uh, UCLA uh, for uh, hosting us this afternoon and tomorrow. Uh, and then I want to add, uh, you know, also our, our partners, uh, the directors of the UC Humanities Centers, which exist on each campus, the deans across uh, all campuses, the deans of humanities across all campuses of the University of California. Uh, the UC Humanities Initiative really is quite unique in bringing into a really engaged work and play with each other um, 10 universities uh, in a way, I, you know, you really can't point to any other university or university system uh, able to do something like that and it really has created uh, an enormous engagement uh, at the cutting edge of thinking carefully about the future of the human and the past of the human uh, and the relation of uh, technologies, the relation of uh, engagements in culture and uh, political theory and so on, critical theory uh, ac across these interventions. Um, uh, finally, before I say just a word about um, UCHRI, uh, I want to say that this, both the 25 years uh, of our history, but certainly this evening's in engagement, um, could not possibly have uh, taken place without the fantastic staff of the UC Humanities Research Institute who have worked tirelessly um, through the past months and in the past week and, and indeed the past few days uh, to put this event together, not least also as they've put together a call uh, and an announcement of an initiative around digital media and learning with the MacArthur Foundation, with Facebook, uh, and with the Mozilla Foundation uh, this morning uh, on uh, what is being called Project Connect. So if you check out Project Connect on the internet, uh, you will see the, uh, the announcement and there's a competition uh, about to take place starting uh, in May. So I, I direct you to that. Uh, let me just add a word about UCHRI. Uh, we have been part of this initiative uh, over 25 years. Uh, it's really interesting to think back across the engagement of the kind of uh, people who have been central uh, to our interactivity uh, from Wendy Brown, who's our current uh, chair of our Board of Governors, and Angela Davis and, and Jean in conversations, Jean Komarov in conversations uh, with other notable scholars. Uh, we hosted an event some almost 10 years ago now uh, in which I was flummoxed to find out that it was the first time that Etienne Baliba and Jacques Derrida shared a public stage together in a discussion uh, on, on race. Uh, we've had conversations that have involved um, people like Judith Butler and Sabah Mahmoud uh, on the question of the secular. We've had conversations uh, and engagements uh, around uh, issues of the post-colonial with Dipesh Chakrabarti and Ashim Bembe. Uh, we've had uh, engagements around uh, questions uh, of the future of the university that various scholars uh, have engaged with. So we're constantly trying to bring to our, um, uh, our collaborative engagement these questions of uh, the humanities both in our own time uh, and in its histories of formation. Um, so uh, it's uh, you know, really a pleasure to see us having arrived at this 25 years, uh, even as we're um, you know, subjected to all the constraints uh, of funding and uh, technology uh, that, uh, that we uh, currently face up to in the humanities collectively. Having said that, I will take no more time but to introduce Wendy Brown. As I said, 
Wendy is currently the chair of the UCHRI Board of Governors. Uh, she is one of the really formative political theorists um, and critical theorists of our day. Uh, she holds a professorship, an endowed professorship uh, in political science um, at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, formerly taught at UC Santa Cruz, so has been a mainstay of uh, I hesitate to say the last 25 years of the history of the University of California, but it's probably true. <laughs> uh, and uh, ha uh, has a very long list of publications uh, I'm sure many of you uh, know about uh, from uh, uh, the most recent uh, uh, co-authored uh, engagement, Is Critique Secular?, uh, to the book on walling and walls that we've all seen uh, on, on political walls, uh, uh, all the way back to states of injury uh, and uh, other books on political theory. So without further ado, and the reason that you've come, all of you here this evening, to celebrate uh, our panel, uh, Wendy Brown will moderate. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome uh, Wendy Brown and the panel. Right, so I know that most of you would like to get on to this, um, but I have to say um, that it's really an honor to be part of this celebration of the UC Humanities Research Institute and especially its collaboration with the Fowler Museum. Uh, and, and just before I introduce our three panelists, I want to say that it's, it's a particular pleasure to acknowledge David Theo Goldberg, the director of HRI, and Marla Burns, the Fowler Museum director, because their vision and their ingenuity and their sheer hard work has piloted these two institutions through very difficult and very precarious times. In an era of budget slashing and privatization, but also an era of the diminution of the very value of the humanities and the arts in favor of revenue generating technical knowledges. David and, and Marla, and, and David Marshall as well, have not only made the Humanities Research Institute and the museum survive, but, but flower. And they are in this way, I think, importantly securing a future that includes the arts and critical inquiry into who and what we are as a people, as a species, as a planet. And that future that they're securing is one that was by no means guaranteed without their tireless work and their vision. So um, I do just want to take a moment to, to celebrate what both have accomplished. Now, finally, here we go. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's three panelists, and each of them will be reflecting on um, something inside the broad rubric, race, representation, repression, and resistance. And they'll be doing it through the prism of the stunning photography of Ernest Cole. Uh, and I, too, want to urge you to see the exhibit if you haven't. Our first panelist will be Jean Komaroff, and there's a great deal to say about each of these extraordinary people, and I'm not going to say it all. I'm going to give you a very brief sense of, of them. After three decades of legendary teaching at the University of Chicago, shepherding more graduate students and inspiring more undergraduates than anyone could count, Jean Komaroff has recently assumed a professorship of anthropology, African, and African American studies at Harvard, one could say she's retired to Harvard, but I don't think you should tell Harvard that, <laughs> where she is also an Oppenheimer Fellow in African Studies. Raised and educated in South Africa, Professor Komaroff did not turn her back on that complex place when she came to the US. Rather, she has studied it relentlessly and creatively, publishing on topics ranging from religion, medicine, and body politics to state formation, crime, and democracy, all always framed by the backdrop of capitalism and colonialism's aftermath. Her most recent work is co-authored Theory from the South or How Euro-America is Evolving Toward Africa. So she'll be our first speaker, and I'm going to introduce all three, and then I'm just going to sit down, and they will speak to you. 
Our second panelist will be Ken Gonzalez Day. He is chair and professor of art at Scripps College. He's an internationally renowned visual artist, as well as a scholar of art. He has dozens of solo and group exhibitions to his name. He's especially interested in the history of photography, concerned with and constructing race, so he's right on the thing we're doing tonight. And his work has offered really brilliant new angles on the history of, for example, lynching in the US, which you can glimpse in miniaturized fashion in his Duke University Press volume called Lynching in the West. He also offered a novel and fascinating account of race, racialization in sculpture and portrait busts. And that was the work of an a, of, of a, um, exhibition entitled Profiled. And it traveled around the world for the last several years. He is, in sum, a rare combination of teacher, artist, curator, critical theorist, writer, and institution builder. He has both an aesthetic eye and a subtle political and historical one. Finally, our third panelist will be Angela Davis. She's undoubtedly the scholar who's most often introduced as needing no introduction, but I think that's wrong. <laughs> In fact, I think she does need an introduction. <laughs> While she's internationally known for her early activism with the Black Panthers and Communist Party, for her firing from UCLA by the UC Regents, for her place on Americans... <laughs> for her place on the American's Most Wanted list and her time in prison, all before the age of 26. A little time has gone by since then. <laughs> but the point I was gonna make is that she's not 26. <laughs> And she's done a great deal since then. She ought to be equally well known for her lifelong work as an activist on issues ranging from prison abolition and death penalty abolition to racial and gender justice to justice for Palestine and a great deal more. She also ought to be well known for her extraordinary work as teacher thinker and researcher during her long stint as professor of history of consciousness and feminist studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, during which time she authored, among many other things, a remarkable book on blues and black feminism. Angela Davis did recently retire and yet, of course, continues her teaching, her work with graduate students, her activism, her lecturing, and her writing. Her most recent book is The Meaning of Freedom from City Lights Press. I want to thank all three panelists for being with us. Each of them will offer about 15 minutes of reflection, though I am not going to be able to police them. I'm usually actually really good at policing panelists, but on this topic and with this group, um, policing feels a little bit out of the question. So I'm hoping there's some, at least some self-restraint. And afterwards, um, after we um, hear from each of them, we will have a bit of conversation. Thank you. So we'll start with Jean Komaroff. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wendy, for that generous introduction and to everybody that's made this event and everything it represents possible. Pictures, says W.J.T. Mitchell, demand something from the viewer. They compel us to recognize the doubleness of all images, the contrast between light and dark, presence and absence, representation and actuality. There's a parallel here with the double consciousness bred by experiences of racism. The split between self and other, subject and object, induced by the intense scrutiny and obfuscation that occurs under the white supremacist gaze. This is from Sean Michelle Smith. How might we think about this parallel through the pictures of Ernest Cole? About the integral connection between visual culture and in particular photography and the anatomy of race in the modern world. Perhaps it's not surprising that it was at a photographic show in Paris in the exhibition of 1900 that W.E.B. Du Bois made his famous observation that the problem of the 20th century was the problem of the color line. These prophetic words apart, Du Bois' celebrated contribution to that exhibition, for which a jury awarded him a gold medal, was entirely wordless. 
it consisted of a selection of 363 photographs, the so-called Georgia Negro albums, a diverse assemblage of images that Du Bois allowed to speak for themselves, sans text, captions, or discourse of any kind. Observers note that the pictures of unnamed individuals, unmarked buildings, unlocated streets, might best be seen as a kind of counter-archive, one that challenged a long legacy of racist taxonomy and the turn of the century racist science that grew out of it. When one looks at them today, at a time when the photo has become ever more graphic, as it were, ever more sensational, one strike, what strikes one most is their banality. It's about Perhaps their ordinariness was precisely the point. The images establish, establish a dignified black presence in the everyday maison of American middle-class life. This against the spectacular erasures of the time, like segregation, criminalization, lynching. Du Bois's portraits poised African Americans, all secure in their homes, offices, or churches, um, together and as, they, as presenting, uh, presenting a kind of visual normality of U.S. middle class life, in a camera obscura, as it were, as a negative that underscored the fact that what made the normal normal was its whiteness. The photos made plain, too, the way in which the color line served to structure the very nature of mainstream perception itself. What Du Bois' pictures underlined then was the integral role of visual technologies in the creation of race as naturalized fact. The modernist faith in photographic realism, in the superior uh, quality of the camera's eye to the artist's hand, had been co-opted in the service of pigmenting the taken for granted. But by the very same token, the camera could be used to disrupt that world. And it was this insight that captured the first generation of black documentary photographers in South Africa in the mid-century, figures like Peter Magubane, Alf Kumalo, and indeed Ernest Cole, who came of age during the apartheid era. Largely self-taught, they embraced the ideal of the camera as a tool of modern humanism, uniquely capable of communicating across cultural divides a faith embodied in landmark statements like that of the Family of Man exhibition, first shown in the MoMA in 1955. Now, critics like Roland Barthes famously scorned such representation for sentimentally suppressing difference and injustice. But black South Africans were already well aware of that truth. Their espousal of African humanism was to, was to be both uh, ironic and profoundly political. It refused all efforts to define Africans as less than fully human, as tribal subjects, as captives of a visually indexed ethic, ethnic culture. There could hardly have been a society, notes David Newbury of South Africa, in which the politics of making and showing images was more apparent. Like all authoritarian regimes, the apartheid state struggled to harness public representation, not least the circulation of photographic images, to harness it to its ideological ends. Hence the preoccupation with censoring film and banning television, thus to stave off a visual awareness of a more integrated late modern world. It was a losing battle against a rising electronic commons whose fast-moving global images eluded parochial regulation. Small wonder then that in this world a black man with a camera was an unsettling prospect, rather like a black man on, on a horse in Quentin Tarantino's representation of race in the southern west western Django Unchained. A black man with a camera was a kind of blasphemy, akin to the view held by some 19th century critics that photography was idolatry because it usurped God's sovereign right to make images. In South Africa, documentary photographers, especially if black, were subject to incessant police harassment, arrest, and banishment. They learned to ply their trade by caginess and subterfuge. Peter Magugvani talks about hiding his lyca in a hollowed out Bible or a loaf of bread, the sorts of things that Africans might carry around in public. A black man's camera here <coughs> became part of his physical being, inseparable from his identity and all the indignities that it endured. Ernest Cole remarks in the introduction to the House of Bondage that he practically starved himself at times to be able to buy film. 
After repeated harassment, he felt compelled to submit to the degradation of being reclassified from black to colored in the effort to deracinate his lens, to gain for it a greater freedom of movement. In the end, he was forced into exile. He termed it a form of death to save his pictures, only to have his magnum opus, the House of Bondage, banned in his homeland, at least until apartheid came to an end when the work gained an unexpected second life. It's the rebirth of that work which we celebrate here, which is a testimony to the uncanny power of photographs to transcend time and refigure history, to vindicate, too, the more transient lives of those they embody. Ernest Cole seems to have been consumed, literally, by his mission. He burst onto the national scene in the 1960s as a very young man with a preternaturally bold vision, especially for an African in that time and place. His object was to compile an epic history that was also an expose of the racial state in operation. The camera was his forensic instrument. Walter Benjamin once described the photographer as a modern diviner detective who saw every spot in the modern city as a crime scene, his pictures exposing the guilt that resided there. In fact, Cole did shoot actual crime scenes, a series of famously candid images that caught abject small-time muggers or tzotzis in the act. But the real crime he aimed for was to capture, uh, was to capture the uh, one perpetuated by the apartheid state. He saved the force of his visual rage for the officials who wielded the, law, the violence of the law, vide the monstrous and panoptical presence of the police or the awful symmetry, which is now an iconic picture, of two huge black hands manacled together in cuffs, or the soulful gaze of a group of young men in a police cell, their arms entwined in the bars, or the street scenes that present again and again the same demeaning drama, the ubiquitous strip and search of passbooks and personal property that deprived Africans of the sine qua non of citizenship, the freedom of movement, and the right to inhabit public space. Shades, of course, of Palestine. But for Cole, the crime of racism was not merely the spectacle of state repression or the violent abuse of the law. His work was founded on a much more complex view of the operation of power, the role of representation, and the everyday biopolitics of race. Hence his insistence on shifting his gaze and altering its focal length, the better to lay bare the multiple scales sights and dramas, integral to the making of one of modernity's most obsessional racial regimes. His pictures show a brilliant grasp of the way in which power takes visual form, how segregation is inscribed in the organization and configuration of space, this being a platform um, where you see the difference between the whites only and the black section of those waiting for trains. <clears throat> in the production of exploitable labor into the postures of children who were being schooled for servitude. He draws attention to the way in which ordinary things serve as accomplices of racial governance. The dizzying cacophony of public signs that issue orders, mark exclusions, and marshal populations in the name of difference. All these trigger uneasy recognition, especially for American viewers. Present, too, among his pictures, were those lyrical forces of life that eluded the grip of repression, though their compass, their compass was narrow and demeaned, states of prophecy, intimacy, and resistance. Cole's dark expose was also colored by the realization in exile that South African racism was merely an archetype. He told a New York Times reporter in 1967 that everywhere he went in the US, he saw racial attitudes very much like those at home. The labile images of House of Bondage closed the gap between there and here, then and now. During the increasingly repressive late apartheid years in the South Africa that Cole left behind, intensified popular struggle drew ever more urgently on the camera as what was called a cultural weapon. Activist photographers actually would call it their AK-47. In much of the West at this time, the authority of realist documentation was being undermined and photography was moving in more personal, ironic, artful directions. But South Africans remained heavily invested in the revelatory power of photo images. As Paul Weinberg notes, the characters, both of apartheid and popular resistance here, were profoundly spectacular, playing on an ever more identifiable 
aesthetic of affect and emergency at home and abroad. Amidst censorship and incarceration, defiant images exploded into view. Icons that radiated repressed histories, defiant if images um, that captured the very production of, of activities that were sabotage in themselves. Hector Peterson, dead in his sister's arms in the midst of the Soweto uprising. Winnie Mandela in Che Guevara Beret, defying house arrest with her fist upheld. In the crescendo of violence that accompanied apartheid's end, a cadre of combatant photographers, the so-called Bang Bang Club, one of whom actually died on the job, uh, documented the birth pangs of a new era. Now, Susan Sontag visited South Africa in 2002 and was struck by the enduring concern here with the politics of political representation. Yet as the racial state morphed into a popular democracy, both politics and representation came into question as never before. To be sure, the transition brought with it novel freedoms of all kinds, a riot of new identities, entitlements, and aspirations that cut across old categories of race and place. Maps were withdrawn, visual cues were scrambled, and the process of image making itself deregulated. Cameras came into the hands of people who had never had them before, ushering in a process of unfettered self-fashioning, both public and personal. Note in this respect the recurrent figure of black cameramen in the recent work of artists of note, like Jackson Kumane or Johannes Sechochelo. There is the uh, angel at the gate with a camera in hand. There's also been a trend away from forensic documentation noticeable especially among the so-called born frees, among children of the post-colony who seek to normalize the present by demythologizing the past, often by reworking iconic apartheid era images for banal purposes like advertising designer clothes. See for example the popular 2004 ad campaign uh, which refigured old whites only signs to mark out and market chic tennis wear to middle-class consumers. In its compositions, it was those who wore the wrong color rather than were the wrong color that were treated as blacks, being arrested by white policemen or being made to clean washroom floors. Yet for all this play, transformation has been uneven. Deep colonial legacies remain. Old economic disparities still following the lines of color for the most part and exacerbated in neoliberal times. This raises trenchant questions about the gap between promise and fulfillment, appearance and reality. A double consciousness emerges again um, and of the uncanny presence in the present of shadows of the past. But how to grasp this ghostliness, the blurring of social form, political force, moral definition? What is representation here? Where do we find the scene of the crime? Can the photo diviner still make visible realities concealed to the naked eye? In continuing to raise these questions, South African photographers draw directly on the legacy of the likes of Ernest Cole, on their historic sensitivity to the close connection between picture making, world making, and race making. And they have been unusually creative in responding to new political times. Vide the work of people like Peter Hugo, whose hyperreal mugshots link a post-apartheid preoccupation with identity to a darker uh, genealogy of colonial race-based pictorial governments. Or the edgy videos of Johannesburg rapper and cultural commentator extraordinaire, Spook Matambo, who addresses an increasingly global public in whiteface. But the spirit of Cole is most immediately apparent, perhaps, in the pervasive desire throughout contemporary South Africa to settle scores with the past to recover memory, both public and personal. Now, Nietzsche might have seen forgetfulness as a condition of adequate future making. But in our times, we've seemed to be, feel moved, even obligated to move forward by disinterring the past, to revisit trauma and divisiveness, therefore to discover a collective sense of being and moral purpose. Here, photographic archives come into their own. In the past, things seemed cut and dried and black and white, so to speak. But photos of the past compli complicate matters. To the degree that we remember in pictures, they provoke highly personalized, particular recollections, journeys of the sensory imagination. 
The various apartheid museums constructed in recent years, it is said, devote themselves to a mission of symbolic reparation. And in so doing, they rely heavily on the dynamic power of images again. None more so than the apartheid museum in Johannesburg, which aims, like the US Holocaust Memorial, to trigger intense emotional identification with victims' experience. Cole's photographs from the House of Bondage uh, form a centerpiece here, summoning the viewer both as a relentless narrative and as a stunning set of works of art. The intention, offers the museum's curator, was to rethink apartheid's history through Cole, through the testimony of his pictures, but also his life, which of course was Cole's own strangely grand project, a project almost prophetically conceived by the artist as a very young man a project once incongruous and precocious in its original setting. And as they did then, these edgy, demanding pictures continue to ask for more, and they continue to point into the direction of new unfolding horizons at the frontiers of race and place. Thank you. So uh, the title I, I gave, is, this is a sort of a, a short version of a longer thing, Absence, Stasis, and Other Non-Decisive Moments. And just a reference there to the Ernest Cole. <clears throat> like everyone here, I'm greatly moved by Ernest Cole's work and his documentation of South Africa's apartheid system. Shot from 1850, sorry, 1958 to 1966, uh, in a recent publication, Ernest Cole Photographer, one of the essays detailed that Cole conceived of his landmark publication, The House of Bondage, after seeing Henry Cartier Bresson's book, People of Moscow. And that he got uh, this photograph by sneaking his camera in a lunch bag uh, into a South African mine uh, beneath his sandwiches and with an apple. <clears throat> and we now know, after being identified by, uh, with the publication of a series of images, he was forced to flee his own country in 1966. He came to the US where his book was released in 1967 and consequently banned in South Africa. Despite working for Magnum Photos, he never adjusted to life in his new country, was said to have struggled mentally, and died homeless in New York in 1990, uh, while I was still living there. As a practicing artist, I was asked to address issues of race, repression, and representation in my own work and in relationship to Ernest Cole's work. Let me begin by saying that my work is not part of the documentary tradition represented by either Cartier-Bresson or Ernest Cole. Um, so I thought I would try to address a few of my own representational strategies as a number of recent, uh, in a number of recent projects because irregardless of the form, they do address issues of race and representation. So what is the humanist documentary tradition? Well, as I'm sure you can see, even if it's just in these two images, the basic principles of narrative photography, Cartier-Bresson, and indeed Magnum became known for, uh, one of the primary goals of such work is about the pleasure of looking and not being seen. And I'm not just referring to the photographer, I'm referring to us, the viewers, and our ability to look at the images the photographers created, to gaze, to consume, or reject, as an extension of what Roland Barthes termed the violence of photography in his classic uh, text, Camera Lucida, uh, published in 1980. Consider Cartier-Bresson's classic image behind the Gare Saint-Lazare, 1932, <clears throat> on the left, in which one sees a slightly blurred pedestrian hopping uh, from a ladder floating in what appears to be a rather deep puddle. <clears throat> the photograph is taken a split second before the man's heel makes contact with the water, and it is the space between his heel and its reflection which came to symbolize what Cartier-Bresson termed the decisive moment. He wrote, Quote, the decisive moment is this simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second of the significance of an event as well as the precise organization of forms which give that event its proper expression, close quote. Indeed, a moment later, uh, and the heel of the shoe would have impacted the water and destroyed the reflection. A moment earlier, and you simply have a man standing in a puddle behind a train station. <clears throat> When one looks a bit longer, one can see a perfect composition, a rich tonal range, and in the background, a poster that seems to echo the figure in the foreground. Uh, I don't have a pointer here, but it's sort of next to that figure in the back. You see this almost looks like a dancing figure or shape. 
On the right side, we see uh, that Ernest Coal employs the same compositional tensions, the same principles of the golden mean, the same rich tones to compose his photograph. Cole has photographed a white man slapping a young boy in the street, while at least two other children look on. The hands of one of the figures in the foreground are outstretched in what appears to be a pleading gesture. One can make out the white man's arm in its, uh, is in motion because it is literally a darkened blur. The right foot of the child that has been struck uh, has just lifted from the ground and suggests the force of the man's fist on the boy's shoulder or head. He raises his uh, arms mid-body, an automatic reaction to block the man's blow. Cole has created an image which pays homage to Cartier-Bresson. In Bresson, the figure flies downward, uh, heel to earth. In the coal, the boy's right foot rises upward, earth to toe. In both, it is the space between the body and earth, <clears throat> the violence uh, of the moment symbolically charged uh, not only uh, in the composition, but establishes the truth claims of the image. So the idea being that it's that space, that sort of tension of the, between the, the foot and the, and, the, and the ground that sort of charges each of the images more than, more than the action itself. In uh, Camera Lucida, Roland Barthes wrote, the photograph is violent, not because it shows violent things, but because on each occasion it fills the sight by force and because in it nothing can be reduced or transformed. To which I would ask, but what if it could? What if its message, whether good or bad, could be refused, transformed photographically? Uh, shortly, I'll give you an example of my own use of absence as a countermeasure to the violence of photography. I will suggest that this use of absence or stasis is a strategy to intervene, disrupt, displace the potentially repressive violence of the photographic image itself. Um, and before that, I do that, I'm, I'm going to also talk about the two series that were mentioned in my introduction. The, uh, basically, the uh, Lynching in the West, 1850 to 1935, which was a publication and had two projects that came out of it, the Erased Lynching series and the Searching for California Hang Trees, and the Profiled Project, which, so you're going to see images from all of these coming up shortly. I should just probably add, uh, since I had to abbreviate it, the, the history of lynching that I looked at specifically was the history of lynching in California for, um, for the dates I mentioned, 1850-1936, because there are no, there were no, and there still are no, aside from my book, any uh, comprehensive list of that period. So if you look at the NAACP, you'll find 50 cases listed for the state of California for that period, of which only uh, two would be recorded as, as black, or actually colored, and the other 48 would be recorded as white. And in looking at that list, I realized that there were a number of Asian names and Latino names in it that were not being recorded. Part of that ha is a much longer lecture about the construction of race in the United States. But the, um, the mini version is that what I uncovered was that in California, in the period before, really primarily before the Civil War, um, it was primarily Latinos, Native Americans, Asians were the primary victims of lynch mobs. And there were, there were cases of, there's two Swiss, uh, one guy from Zurich. You know, there's, there's Europeans, because of course they're just arriving from Europe, right? So there's examples from many different nations, many different sort of European cultures, but the largest single group is, is Latinos. And it's, it's something that has not been widely recognized. And so that's why I'm repeating it here. Even though I, I wrote a book, it's a book that probably no, no one has read or maybe hasn't, haven't seen. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think it's worth restating that. And that, that also is the point of departure for, for thinking about, as I was thinking about Ernest Cole and his project, here he's trying to talk about a history of something that wasn't being talked about. And I felt like I'm at UCLA, I should, I'm going to talk about this. So, uh, <laughs> so there's a couple uh, sort of brief introductory images here, and then I'm going to read you a short passage from the book. In this one, you can see, just to give you the idea of it, in this one, you see it's, a, it's from the Erased Lynching series, 2006, where I took uh, archival images from photographic archives found in Oakland and uh, appropriated them and basically took out the two lynched bodies that were in the original event. Uh, the two uh, bodies were white bodies in this particular case. There were two white men that were kidnappers. And uh, in this uh, case, which took place in 1934, um, 
There were over 8,000 people that came to, to witness it, and um, it was a huge, huge event. This corresponds, of course, with at this point with Southern lynchings, which are also having these huge numbers. And this whole role of the, uh, of the photograph and of the flash, actually, something I write about in the book, uh, in, in a nutshell, the flash makes it possible to capture this image. It's a kind of image that couldn't exist before, and it's a kind of image that photography has a direct hand in shaping. Photography also has a direct hand in shaping the practice. So the practice shifts after the advent of photography, right? It, the way it's used to basically commodify these images. Um, so in this image, you see the, the, full, the full scene. This is the way it was installed in uh, one of the installations in Paris at the Palais de Tokyo in 2009. The main point here, which I need to do quickly, is that most people mistakenly imagine photographs to be two-dimensional, to be flat. <clears throat> Obviously, they're not. If you have a photograph or photo album, they, they have mass. They might not be a lot of mass, right? They're thin, but they have, uh, they have a back, they have a front, they have sides. The, the point is that a lot of archival information happens on the back of images. And if you were a photo collector, if there's any photo collectors out there, the thing you care most about when you spend $10,000 on a print is whether it's signed. So that's going to happen on the back. So all of the things that give value to an image happen, or many of them happen on the back. This image you could download from my website. You could print it out and have it, right? Is that going to change anything as far as the value goes? Not until it's signed, then it gets, right? So that's so this, all the stuff that happens on the back of the image. I wanted to get the viewer to rethink their relationship to the photographic image, to rethink their relationship to this history, which they think of as being uh, passive onlookers. But in fact, you can't experience this piece. Might be hard to see. It's, a, it's in a corner, 45 degree angle. You can't physically see it unless you turn your body in some manner. And this was a direct response to the, uh, to the, uh, to the notion that the photograph is violent, that you can't resist it. So this is an example of resisting it. You don't have to look both ways, right? It, it, it ad, allows the possibility of agency. And so I was trying to think of ways to rethink the way we engage with photographs as a way of expanding the discourse around photography, right? This little mini version, okay, so. Um, one more example. So in this one, I've removed the, the body uh, using basic Photoshop, uh, removed the body and the rope of the lynch victim, which in this case was a Mexican. Um, probably a Mexican national, uh, lynched along the border, the U.S.-Mexican border, probably in Texas. The men that you see are wearing U.S. Army um, police uniforms because they're serving military personnel, and they've decided to uh, lynch a Mexican, who, or Mexican-American, we don't know, um, at the border, and then they've called him dis Disguised Bandit. It's on the original photograph. So all I did was take out the body and the rope, and I've left them with their pulling, their tugging, the sort of, um, to open a space for us to engage with this history in a way that we wouldn't if I had you looking at the image of a, of a cadaver, right? So trying to rethink, again, this question of the violence of photography, which can be both symbolic, can be metaphoric, can be literal, could be represent, representational. All right, we'll do one more. And these are all much larger projects, so I'm just giving you a little super mini version here. And uh, in this one, obviously, the main point is that it shifts your focus away from the figure of the lynch victim and moves it to the, the idea of the, of the social, of the political. So we see all of the audience members there not looking at the body. They don't, they're, not in, they're looking at the camera, right? Okay, and I need to... Um, I actually, this is from the Profiled series, and it shows the idea of sort of the archiving of, of racial difference. This is from the Field Museum where they had cataloged what in 1930 were considered to be the 104 races of the world. And this is a set of three photographs from the Keenholz uh, sculpture that was at LACMA, if anybody saw it, Five Car Stud, which is a, his recreation of a lynching of an African-American lynching um, that was presented in Documenta in Germany in 1972 and then was put away in storage. And uh, I'm gonna read a little section about this idea of the archive again. But basically this object, these, the sculptures, this sculpture even came out of this sort of storage space, right? And it's sort of represented to us. I, uh, in the, the tree was added and it was only shown in Los Angeles, which I thought was sort of ironic. Um, and of course, also, that it's the city that has the most Latinos lynched anywhere in the world. And 
uh, and yet it re remains invisible even in the context of the exhibition at LACMA, right? There was still no way to know that. It, there was no wall text or signage or any way to know that history. So thinking about these layers of invisibility that sort of wash over different communities, here's just a close detail. Um, it actually, sh it's, if you didn't see the piece, it's a, cl it's a clear plastic head with a second head inside and actually it's sort of the, seems to reflect the idea of double consciousness. Um, over the years, the plastic has turned a dark color, so you, you can't really see it probably on the screen, but if you could see the, the real print, you would. And here, uh, again, and I was given permission by Nancy Keenholz to shoot it, and the idea of shooting it, I wrote, also wrote an article on the piece thinking about this, the relationship between all of these aspects of it. Okay, so, and, and these were from the second part of that project, which I then set out to look for the site. So part of it was to actually take the history, these images, which were all taken in the West, uh, none of which had images of African Americans, um, but were mostly la Latino and white. And then, based on the research which I did to uncover the, the history of lynching, which I uncovered over 350 cases, then I set out to go look for the sites, basically got in my car, loaded my, my 10 Deardorff camera, and went driving around the California landscape searching for the, the trees. So the, the, the series is called Searching for California Hang Trees, and uh, I will note that it's not called Finding California Hang Trees. So I did find quite a few, but in some cases, and in many cases, I couldn't be certain. So in this case, you can see here, okay, I'm in the right area, but I don't know if that tree is still there or if the tree is there, but am I gonna let that stop me? No. <laughs> Why? Because I'm not claiming this is a documentary project, right? I'm claiming that it documents my journey. I did indeed go to all three, look for all these sites. That is true. But the question of documentary and what is documented is sort of entered, enters into this. So I wanna just, so these are some of the trees. And this one will be in a show at the Smithsonian, uh, which will be coming up, dealing with sort of uh, some of this history, which is pretty amazing. Here's an installation as it was done in uh, Medellin. Just a bunch of the trees. And there's a larger section that I, that I write on about this impact of the flash, and the, basically this idea of the night vision and, and its impact, right, which I kind of summarized. And then this is as it was installed in a, a billboard. So Los Angeles doesn't have any of the trees left. I do have a free walking tour on my website, uh, which you can take from Union Station around downtown and visit um, 36 of the sites, um, some of which were, were legal executions, some of which were lin uh, illegal, all were Latino. All right, and then to get to this, this is the one image uh, from, of research. So this has never been shown as a artwork by me. It doesn't appear in the book, which is a historical book, right? So it, it, you can't uh, not include historical material. Uh, and I just wanted to read you a little short, I, I edited it down to like less than a, a page to try to hopefully stay close. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it, you know, you'll see it ties into the images, image analysis of the, f of the first two images, okay. After the sun rose on May 3rd, Anglo men and boys slowly began to assemble at the edge of town. As they struggled to get closer, to get a closer look at the broken bodies of Arias and Chamalos, um, those arriving at the scene encountered an added treat. Standing just in front of the two lifeless bodies was a strange box on wooden legs. It was a photographer's camera. Peering at this curious contraption and apparently directed to stand behind the two carefully turned bodies, a wall of Anglo men and boys stood four rows deep when the picture was finally taken. In the space between the suspended bodies, two barefoot children don't even seem to notice the hanging bodies as they eagerly peer into the camera's dark eye. In fact, one might be startled to discover that all eyes are transfixed, not on the victim's body, but on the camera itself. Some viewers may want to interpret this image as a, pre a precursor to documentary photography, but unlike the modern documentary uh, photography which strove to make the camera disappear and to let the viewer experience the world with as little mediation as possible, the Aries and Tamales image doesn't even attempt to document the crowd's reactions. If it documents anything, it documents the presence of the photographer and the spectacle of the camera itself. Taken in 1877, this image is one of the earliest photographic images of a lynching uh, taken in the United States. Photographed a few hours after they had been lynched, most of the faces in the crowd are discernible, if slightly blurred. 
Some might interpret these blurry figures as a technical flaw, but the juxtaposition of the living against the dead may actually serve the same symbolic function as the extended display of the lynched body itself. It transforms the photographic instant into something more. It smears time. It acknowledges that time is passing and bodies are moving. It is uncanny, a photographic stutter which extends that photographic instant to infinity and for me is the most chilling truth of the lynching photograph that this scene will never end. It is the unpleasantness of this experience which, like the soldier at war or the executioner above the galleries, cannot be undone, but can be forgotten, repressed, sublimated, and yes, um, you know, archived. In the portrait photograph, a loved one can be returned their youth or brought back to life in the imagination of the viewer. But what can the lynching photograph offer the living? In such images, there can be no youthful smile, no innocence, no eternal return, only, only internal denial. <clears throat> As I suggested earlier, the presence of absence is achieved through digital manipulation and in searching for California hang tree series, it is primarily through language. Uh, I should go back to one of those, just, just so, you have a, so you don't have to look at it. Or put more simply, in the race lynching series, the literal representation of violence, the bodies and ropes were digitally removed, erased from the scene, and the jeering crowd was left right. Uh, for many artists and art historians, documentary photography as a genre was impacted by those critical historians who questioned its claims for, of objectivity, along with its implicit cultural, racial, and gender biases. <clears throat> so what might constitute documentary practice today? Is the act of documenting something photographically enough? Or must it be tied to humanist notions of nation, progress, and difference? Must it capture a specific action, illustrate a cultural meta-narrative as an artist author and educator, my work has been engaged with and responded to issues of identity, discrimination, and disenfranchisement for the past two decades. It is here that I would like to suggest that my practice often engages with issues, e.g. social issues, not unlike those found in traditional documentary work. Racial violence, questions of justice, disenfranchisement, institutional racism, the ongoing struggle for equality and social justice in our own time, just to name a few. So one might say, that my work embraces the same progressive humanist ends as much documentary work, even if it does not engage the same photographic means. How am I doing on time? You're done? Kind of done. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you're not done. We would like to go on, but... Um, yeah, I think yeah. we're good. Let me just get to the last image. So these are from the sculpture series. I knew I put too many in. Thank you. Okay, let me first say that it is truly an honor to be on this panel. Should I uh, bring this closer or? Okay, is that better? Okay. All right, as I was saying, <laughs> it is truly an honor to participate in this uh, panel with uh, Jean Kamaroff, uh, Ken De Gonzalez, and of course, uh, Wendy Brown, and there are a lot of other thank yous. I could to begin with David Marler, but I'm going to skip that because I only have 15 minutes. Um, and of course, the occasion of this panel is the um, incredible exhibition of Ernest Cole's work here at the Fowler. One of the great ironies of history is that Cole died just a week before Mandela was released and thus before the process uh, that promised so much social transformation in South Africa. There was the promise, and of course there is the current reality. And one might make that distinction within many historical contexts, but I want to approach the work of 
Ernest Cole, which addresses apartheid, and at the same time troubles the representational practices that would seem to be called for um, even by the theme of this gathering, race, representation, repression, and uh, resistance, by referring to another time and place. Um, as many of you know, this is the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, the 50th anniversary of the um, Birmingham campaign. And so I want to begin with a brief discussion of Martin um, Berger's book, which is called Seeing Through Race, a Reinterpretation of Civil Rights Photography. Berger, Berger develops a critique of iconic um, civil rights photographs, and I intentionally am not um, bringing slides to you because I would like to ask you to imagine those photographs, to consider the afterlife of, of the images. Um, and he develops a critique of iconic civil rights photographs, and primarily the work of photojournalists uh, whose um, images were chosen by the dominant press to represent the essence of the freedom struggle in uh, the South that black people were waging at that time. And his argument is that most of those photographs represent black people as relatively passive, uh, of course, nonviolent, uh, uh, but um, not active. And the southern white thugs stand in for the racism that is depicted in, in, in the photographs. Uh, and I'm sure everyone is um, aware of the images of police dogs attacking uh, protesters, right? Um, there's that image of uh, John Lewis uh, during the Selma to Montgomery march. So uh, he is in the foreground of the photograph and um, a policeman is uh, hitting him and he has his hand on his head. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen that image many, many times. Uh, um, now, Berger is concerned in, the, in his book with the work that these photographs did uh, at the time to distance northern whites from the racism that is represented in the photographs. Uh, uh, the racism that is represented as being the product of white thugs. Um, and of course, since their behavior is represented as lawless, the, represent the resolution of the problem of racism can only be imagined as a process of bringing them into the realm of law, bringing them to justice, criminalizing racist behavior. And in fact, he argues that the civil rights story of Birmingham, um, and I should say that uh, I just um, visited Birmingham two weeks ago to participate in um, the 50th anniversary uh, of uh, the Birmingham civil rights movement. But he argues that the civil rights story of Birmingham was, quote, brought to a tidy journalistic close when, and 2002, the last living participant of the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church uh, was convicted of murdering um, Carol Robertson, um, uh, Denise Wesley, uh, Cynthia Wesley, rather, Carol, Addie Mae Collins, and Denise uh, McNair. Uh, his name was Bobby Frank Cherry. He was sentenced to life in prison. Berger points out that newspapers at that time wrote admiringly of the new generation of Southern white prosecutors eager to pursue the 1960s most infamous unsolved cases and of the radically altered social and racial climate in the New South. 
And he argues that the iconic civil rights imagery he examines both helped, interestingly, both helped to promote the aims of the struggle and those photographs promoted a very limited understanding of the actors and the terrain of that struggle. And so in the last paragraph of the book, uh, he, he says, and I'll, it's a, an extended um, uh, passage, I'll read it. My concern with iconic civil rights imagery, it's not its failure, is not its failure to advance black rights. As I have been at pains to argue, the photograph supported many of the aims for which blacks struggle. At issue is the price that the photographs extracted for their promotion of reform. In order to safely move whites to either tolerate or embrace social and legislative change, the photographs occluded various racial facts, including the agency of blacks in shaping American history and the shared beliefs of reactionary and progressive whites. When we reproduce civil rights photographs today with the same framing that dominated media accounts in the 1960s, we inadvertently enforce the racial status quo. Before we can, quote, write the final page of the civil rights era, we must reframe the iconic photographs and develop a more progressive canon of images. Until we do so, the most significant social work of civil rights photographs will continue to be the limits they place on the exercise of black power. Now, of course, it's very difficult to extricate photographic images of black people, people of color from historical context and from the context of the history of philosophy, context, uh, the history of photography, history of philosophy as well. Uh, um, and these contexts are saturated with racism. Scholars like Deborah Willis um, have dedicated their, their work to uh, revealing this process. And as a matter of fact, uh, her new book, which was published uh, on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is called Envisioning uh, Emancipation, has some remarkable um, images uh, uh, that have never been associated uh, with uh, the effort to end slavery and uh, the, 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 the struggle for um, freedom. Uh, and parenthetically, it's, this book was published as a way to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, but I find that it's quite uh, interesting that we haven't been called upon to participate in any major celebration of uh, the sesquicentennial of the Emancipation Proclamation, isn't it? Yes. Do you find that bizarre? Yes. Um, well, uh, I've thought about this a great deal. It, it, it may very well be the case uh, because uh, uh, that if we embarked on such uh, a celebration, we might come to the conclusion that we have very little to celebrate. Uh, uh. <laughs> but I began by referring to, through uh, Berger, to these iconic civil rights photographs, because I think we can discover an important cautionary tale here, not only with respect to representational practices, uh, but also with respect to the ease with which the story of a movement with such radical potential can be assimilated into a dominant narrative regarding the triumph of democracy. When Rosa Parks died in 2005, we witnessed her elevation to the status of a national hero. Uh, some of you may remember uh, that she was only the 31st, the 31st person in the history of the U.S. whose body was presented to uh, the public through a viewing in the Capitol Rotunda. 
And her story, as narrated through this act, became a story of discrimination put to rest, of racism overcome, of democracy triumphant. Uh, and in this context, I want you to imagine another image, which I'm sure you have seen repeatedly. Um, and that is the 1955 uh, UPI uh, Bettelman photograph of Rosa Parks sitting with great dignity on a public bus, which is empty as far as we can see, with the exception of a single anonymous white man who is sitting behind her. Um, that photograph, it seems to me, is the centerpiece of a narrative that culminated with the Capitol Rotunda uh, viewing of her body, taken after the Supreme Court ruling in the aftermath of the Montgomery bus boycott. It represents triumph over racism, and it represents it as an individual act, thus further enshrining individualism as the hallmark of democracy. Half a century later, racism is supposed to be no more than a blemish in the country's past, an obstacle to the rule of democracy, which has been successfully challenged. Now, of course, uh, Mrs. Parks vigorously um, contested the narrative uh, that she had refused to stand up because uh, she was tired. And you know that story as well, don't you? Uh, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired. But that is not true. I was not tired physically, or no more tired than I usually was at the end of the day. I was not old, although many people have an image of me being old then. <laughs> I was 42. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. And so Rosa Parks was an activist. Uh, uh, her decision was a conscious one. As a matter of fact, it was the organizing work of women like Rosa Parks and others who are consistently excluded from the established historical record that created the conditions for the emergence of the young um, Dr. Martin Luther King as leader. But of course, the hegemonic narrative is one of tired feet and the serendipitous arrival of a young minister in Montgomery, tired feet attached to a black woman's body, and Dr. King, heroic male individual, produced by themselves the great civil rights movement. Uh, yeah. And this is why women like Joanne Robinson remain unacknowledged for uh, their pivotal role in organizing the Montgomery bus boycott, or Claudette Colvin for her refusal to move to the back of the bus and her subsequent arrest nine months before Rosa Parks. Um, now, that photograph of Rosa Parks, which I mentioned, uh, so overdetermines our understanding of her um, role as an activist that we are amazed to learn that in the 1930s she and her husband were involved in the defense of the Scottsboro Nine. Interestingly, another a, a kind of historical closure has happened um, with that case uh, uh, since uh, a few weeks ago the Alabama legislature um, um, uh, voted on a posthumous pardon for all of the Scottsboro Nine. Um, Rosa Parks and her husband hosted clandestine Voters League meetings in the early 1940s. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in 1943, she was elected the secretary of the NAACP branch in Montgomery, which meant, uh, uh, you know, not secretary in the sense that you take minutes, <laughs> but it meant that she interviewed people and documented cases of brutality and racism and unsolved murders. Uh, one major case she was involved in was the case of Recy Taylor, uh, who was gang raped 
by a group of white um, men. And there's actually a, a, another very interesting book that just was just published uh, uh, by Daniel McGuire, Danielle McGuire, and it's called At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape, and Resistance. Uh, and that book uh, details, among other things, the role that Rosa Parks played uh, early on in challenging um, uh, the, uh, uh, these uh, acts of racism. Now, moving on to Ernest Cole. Oh, and I'm over time already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that okay, Wendy? Just a couple of minutes. Uh. Okay, what I wanted to say about Ernest Cole is that what is so remarkable about his photographs is that they tell a story that has no easy closure. Unlike the iconic photos of the civil rights movement, they do not enact this historical closure. They trouble a narrative of apartheid that represents it as the work of bad individuals who must be brought to justice in order for that era to come to a close. Uh, and speaking of apartheid, I feel compelled to mention Israeli apartheid, especially, especially since uh, yesterday was Palestinian Prisoners' Day. And I spoke yesterday at another 25th anniversary uh, celebration. It was the 25th anniversary of the Middle East Children's Alliance in Berkeley. Uh, um, but I, about Ernest Cole's photographs, there is a kind of insightful banality um, about his photos, especially the ones that represent white people. The woman, for example, sitting on a bench bearing the sign, um, Europeans only, uh, even the ones showing black-white intimacy, a white man, you know, holding a black child. Uh, uh, and then, of course, there are the photographs of, um, of, 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 of children uh, um, attempting to learn. Uh, there's that amazing one of, um, of, of, of pupils the, um, in, a, in a classroom and the majority of them are eagerly raising their hands uh, to answer a question that was uh, obviously asked by the teacher. Um, and so education, um, liberation, uh, reminds me of Du Bois and his uh, call for abolition democracy in the aftermath of slavery. Uh, uh, that um, slavery could not simply be negatively abolished. The institutions that would have been required to incorporate former slaves into uh, a new democratic order uh, uh, were not uh, created. And when they were, they were overturned uh, as a result of uh, the um, dismantling of radical reconstruction. And so, yeah, um, um, what I see is a, is, is a kind of banality in those photographs uh, that uh, creates a historical continuum that compels us to see the ghost of apartheid in the minor struggle today for example, in South Africa, in the campaign of prison privatization, just as we see the remains of slavery in black communities and the prisons that hold disproportionately black populations. And so the, the powerful aesthetics of Ernest Cole's work still um, compel us to look backward at apartheid and look forward toward a future promise of liberation. Thank you. So um, if the people who are leaving would leave quickly and quietly and um, the people who desperately want seats, come in quickly and quietly. You can come in now.
Um, we'll take just 30 seconds for that changing around. And then we have about half an hour for your comments or questions. We have, um, so please, please let's just do this as quietly as we can and then we'll just get started. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to pick up their microphones now. Mm -hmm. We have some extraordinary um, juxtapositions, but also some differences in, in the themes that came out in thinking about photography, and particularly photography of racial repression. Jean gave us images of the camera as a forensic instrument, but also as an AK-47. She raised the question of forgetfulness, but also settling scores with the past, and photography's role in this. Ken gave us quite a tour of an antithesis to what he calls the repressive violence of the photograph, and some strategies for avoiding that repressive violence. And Angela, it seems to me, gave us two different ways of coming into the potential repressive violence of the photograph. First, by citing Berger and reminding us about the possibilities or the risks of the distancing of the viewer from racism and the elimination or erasure of the agency of the subjugated, but then coming back at the end and, and reminding us that there might also be something quite evocative in what she called the banality. Mm -hmm. that these photographs represented. So we have a lot of different themes, um, but I'm going to stop there and invite you to either pick up any of these themes or um, to simply ask questions or to offer comments. Whatever you do, let me urge you, because there's 300 of us in this room in just half an hour, keep it as brief as you can. All right, I will take... Um, Questions, comments, whatever else. There's one right in front. And speak loudly, and if you will, oh, you have a mic. Never mind, don't speak loudly. <laughs> and I'll take the occasion to put my mic on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's such an honor to hear you speak. You know, I've been thinking really recently, I live near the 405, and there's a lot of helicopters, you know, tracking traffic. And I've been thinking about the embedded journalists that went to Afghanistan and thinking about the domestic embedded journalist citizen. And um, I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that um, historically, but also in terms of the contemporary role of the embedded journalist citizen. Thank you. As you wish. Yeah. Uh, I find it, what you say is fascinating because I think that in many ways, both the sense that of the limits of documentary photography and still the continuing possibilities of recording things in fast time, from the Rodney King story to recent protests on the campus at the University of Chicago to the closing of the last emergency center on the south side. And one of the things that happened in that struggle, when there's an effort of the university police to actually arrest students, was somebody whipped out a cell phone and somebody recorded that. And that evening, it was circulating around on, on YouTube, right? And, and, and that changed the very nature of the event. So at the same time, as one realizes, um, precisely what you're saying, I think, Angela, that, that the reinscription of race in photographs is always there. There always is within pictures, you know, the current forms of inequality and deception and ideological construction and so on. At the same time, the ability of the photograph still that vestige, that it captures something, yeah. which is a truth that's not so easily contestable. It reveals the crime. Seems to be, to, to be some aspect of the way in which the embedded citizen photographer operates. Yeah and that the new technologies have made the instant radiation of that even more, 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 more powerful. Yeah? And at the same time, um, the, the, the use of uh, the citizen photography as um, evidence, as um, uh, forensic photography, re recalls the, the early um, period of the history of the of photography when police photographs Not played sure. such an important role in um, develop in the development of the medium, and I'm actually thinking about the 
extent to which people's uh, uh, cell phones uh, have been used in the current uh, Boston Marathon uh, case. Yeah. And, exactly. And, and, and interestingly, um, uh, uh, the, the, the images of two men with uh, hoods, with hoodies on, which recalls Trayvon Martin, and you know, it, I mean, it's it's so interesting uh, the, the the way in which uh, you know all of uh, these um, issues of racism are so embedded in in the image, regardless of how we uh, think we are using uh, 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 that technology. Um, the case of Oscar Grant, for example, uh, who was killed. In, in a BART station in Oakland a, a few years ago, uh, 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 that that actually played very a very minor role mm. in the the legal case uh, because, mm. as was the case with Rodney King, mm. that imagery can always be recontextualized and resituated exactly. and resignified. Uh, so I think it's important not to assume that the image is evidence by itself. No, of course not. Okay. I, I would just uh, say, the, ooh, can you hear me? It yes. feels like really loud. Um, that, that, that in the longer version of this, which I'm still working on, is that there's, I think that the, the time has come to start to think about a distinction to be made between documentary as a genre and the idea of the document. Yeah. So what we're talking about here with a cell phone is the document, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that we all can do, we can look up on YouTube or whatever on Flickr and find the sunset for today, probably everywhere in the world, right? So why get on a plane, why go anywhere, why take another picture? <laughs> Is there a difference if I take the picture or if you take the picture, right? So that's where we get into this idea of, and, and one of the things with photography in general is that the genres, that the, all the, this idea of genre itself is sort of plagues the, the discipline. So yeah. I think part of the strategy in the longer version that, that I have of this then if we take document instead of documentary, then where do you put documents? Then you have the archive, and then we have this idea of archive as a depository. And what is the archive? Mm -hmm. Well, the archive is, it's, the photograph sits there just like the Library of Congress until you need it. And then when you need it, you Google Dorothea Lang, migrant mother, or whatever it is you want to find, <laughs> and it pops up in high res or low res or three different res mm -hmm. levels. And suddenly that thing that was a minute ago just data, just document, mm -hmm. suddenly has now become art or be transformed again. So a lot of it is, is about, and that, that is all predicated on the, the commodity culture and the, the photograph as a commodity. So when it's reproduced and its reproducibility changes its status from document to documentary. <laughs> and then you get into these things about the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of what I was starting to introduce a little bit, that there are all these um, very somewhat formulaic ways of understanding beautiful composition that also can also be a way of, of dismantling some of the conventions. Right. So um, you don't have to come up here because it's too hard, right? So, but if you do, but if I call on you, would you speak up? Okay, so I'm gonna ask for two questions now. You and there's a person nearby you. Who, who was the other hand that was right up here? Okay, then you. So two at once and then I'll ask the panelists to respond. quite a bit of money for you to get out of prison back in the day. And it's just such an honor to see you so powerful and working so beautifully to make change. And my question is about the new slavery, which is the privatization of the prison systems. Can you share something mm -hmm. on that? So I'm going to take one other question okay. while you think about that. Back here. Yes. You. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. This question is also for Professor Davis. Tell us what it was like being up in Berkeley last night and how you felt in that entire process and what it meant to you that it actually passed. Okay. <laughs> I'll see if I can be succinct. Uh, I'll ask, uh, answer your question. Uh, first, you're referring, to the, you're referring to the 25th anniversary of the no, vote at UC Berkeley. He's referring to the UC Berkeley The vote at UC Berkeley. Yes, but, but uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, there were, I think, almost 1,000 people at the First Congregational um, um, Church in Berkeley. 
and we passed a unanimous resolution supporting a students for justice in Palestine and their resolution. Um, and then at, uh, at 5.30 a.m. this morning, the student senate passed that resolution. Was it 12 to 9? 9 to 7. 9 to 7. 9 to 7. Okay, the other question about, uh, well, and that's a complicated question, uh, 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 privatization and uh, slavery, because I think that uh, the way in which the um, vestiges of slavery are still with us through uh, the uh, prison system actually goes much further than privatization. Privatization may be one mode, uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the way in which uh, punishment for profit developed in the aftermath of slavery, you mm -hmm. see the direct imprint uh, of that historical era on uh, the current uh, 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 system of um, over-incarceration. Um, but thank you very much for the question. OK, we'll take two more. And I see you, and I see you. And then I'm going to go to the back, I promise. I'm going to put my glasses on and call on people in the okay. back. But right now, first we'll start here, and then you. Could you speak up just a bit more? Please. I'm from your country, by the way. It's good to know that you're here. Uh, my question to you, um, often, um, I'm often curious about one's perception about what they feel and they think when they see the images, um, especially the pictures that came during a party. Yeah. There's this one image in particular that I was in when I was 15 years old. Yeah. As a part of the Spud Walk Rising. Yes. I got shot through the knee. Yes. And it's the image of Hector Peterson's brother yeah. holding Hector Peterson. Yeah. If you look at that photo, four people back, you'll see me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 15 years old and I'm running with a little girl who just had gotten shot in the head. Oof. She's over my shoulder and I'm running. And if you look at the photos closely, you'll see soldiers and police running behind the crowds of kids shooting us in the back as we were yeah. running away. My question to you, when you first saw that photo as a South African, not yeah. as a white, yeah. but as a South African, yeah. how did that personally make you feel? Yeah. And I ask the same question to all the members of that panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you sit with that for a second? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, this is specifically directed at Mr. De Gonzalez. Um, the, concerning the absence of violence in your photos, which I thought was very moving, thank you so much for that. Uh, isn't the concern, morally at least, uh, when we view this art, not necessarily the, the absence of, of, of violence, uh, but, but rather the presence of, of uh, a misrepresentation of violence? So we talked a little bit about the movie uh, the Tarantino film that just came out, which showed slavery in a way which was romanticized and did not speak truth to it. And we have other movies in Hollywood right now that are talking and, and showing uh, the Israeli-Palestine conflict in a way that is humorous at best. Um, so rather than the repression of violence, uh, what about the, 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 the repression of, uh, of mocked up, gaudy, uh, not real uh, uh, violence? Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, and I think that in many ways that, that set of images yeah. is seared on the consciousness of not only uh, contemporary South Africans but the world, as you say. Yeah. There are many things in what you've said. Yeah. And one of them relates to the fact of who is foregrounded and who is backgrounded in the very nature of photography itself and the degree to which the personification of that event yeah, has led to and, and it's continuous with truth and reconciliation. And I think in some ways somebody made, I think you did, Andrew, a reference to the fact yeah, that the way that we have dealt with the transition in South Africa, yeah, admirable in many ways that it was, yeah, has still sought to make it a matter of 
spectacular violence that individuals were responsible for, yeah, that the, lo the logic of law and forgiveness yeah, and the whole idea of the way that memory functions even in the photographs in the Apartheid Museum is to personify history rather than to deal with its larger political structural elements. And what I feel with above all else, and I was in London when those photographs first came out, yeah, that one had the sense there uh, of the complicity of everybody in that history including the British who were educating me at the London School of Economics. Mm. And in a way, like the photographs that you're suggesting, you know, they were the virtuous whites in the North and those in the South, who God knows were not virtuous, you know, but they, we were all complicit. Mm. But what makes me most uh, distressed of all, in a way, is that in the society that I see now, the situation of black school children is not that much better than it was in that photograph. Mm. Right? And therefore, yeah. The long-term consequences of that kind of forgiveness have to be thought very carefully, and this is where I come to the question of documentary photography. Yeah. There are many ways in which you can see those photographs as a certain symbolic recon reconciliation, but the real work, the real revolution in that respect has not yet happened. Right? And the problem in South Africa is poor, the blacks are poorer than they ever were, and the difference between the haves and the have-nots yeah, is greater than it ever was, but there's a sense in which there's been some kind of closure and exoneration, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. It, what happened in some ways was miraculous in the sense that the bloodbath that was expected at the end of apartheid didn't happen, but that has lulled us into a sense that this is an image of certain kinds. We have a very progressive constitution, but as many people will tell you in the countryside, you can't eat a constitution. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to respond to the second question. Okay. Uh, so this, I didn't get to all the way through my papers, you might have guessed. So the last part I, I had that, I, that I'm still working on thinking about is this shift between um, absence and stasis. So if all of these, uh, so, so what's missing in the erased ones is literally the body I raised. But the idea of stasis is something that, and I'm thinking of that, the absolute opposite of the decisive moment, which is to capture this this thing just before it happens. I, I'm actually, I photograph things that don't move at all. Like in all three projects, there's no motion. The trees move a little bit in the wind, I guess. And the sculptures, if they sit long enough, dust blends on them. But this idea of, a, of, an act, of, a, of trying to rethink photography around <laughs> complete stillness or stasis as a strategy. That's not funny or not playful. And I haven't seen the, that movie um, yet. I, I hope to. Um, so I don't know the exact reference to it, but I, I think uh, your idea was maybe that things that poke fun at or something, of, or recast? Romanticize. Romanticize, yeah. okay. So I, I think what I'm trying to do is not romanticize. I'm trying to sort of suck all the air out of the room so that there's a sense in which, and the last slide I had was so beautiful. I have this lo lovely section on it. It's a sculpture covered in dust and the, the and it's a Native American. It was, it's a copy. I have not been able to get in the Smithsonian collection. But they made copies in the 19th century, and they sent a copy to, of all of them to Paris. So I got to Paris, and I photographed them there. And I asked them, would you, would you like to clean it before I take the picture? Would you like me to clean it before I take the picture? I'm happy to do it. Um, they said, no, you can't touch it. No, we're not going to clean it. And I know in their mind, they're thinking that it's an imposition, that I'm they're getting even with me somehow, right? For, for daring to show up, for daring to ask to want to know about my nation's history and how race figured into that, beginnings of that history, um, that that is such a ridiculous thing to ask them, that, they, that I deserve to be, uh, to be given this dusty thing and ha ha, <coughs> see if you can make art out of that, right? Mm -hmm. And I took the picture, I'm like, absolutely, uh, however, you, however you want it to be represented. And so I, I argue that that, this, you know, a, a sense of it that 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 stasis that this they could clean it off tomorrow. So that, if that image gets reproduced, if it never gets printed again, if it goes in the archive, if you never see it anywhere else, they'll clean it the next minute, right? They'll wipe all the dust off and they'll try to pretend that that didn't happen. But the event is this dust. So this idea of stasis is it's not just absence. It's that that, that actually staying still. Mm -hmm. Things move around you, everything else, other kinds of actions become more visible. And so that's sort of this, the, the second component of that that I've been starting to try to articulate. Right. 
Mm. Hope that helps. Okay, I promised the back of the room. So there's a group of three of you right there, <sighs> and you all have just been elegant and concise, so I'm gonna urge the three of you to do the same. You know who you are, you are all next to each other. Really loud, because we're old. <laughs> we did. And the person next, yes, good. Um, this is also addressed to uh, Dr. Davis. Um, I was most intrigued by um, your analysis about uh, what you were saying about the role that black women played in the civil rights movement and how it's understated. And in particular, the role that black women played in the um, bus boycott. I'm just curious to know, in your view, how does that historical understanding um, compare to the image of African American women in the book and movie, The Help? <laughs> That's really hard. Okay, there's one more question on this side of you. Thank you. Yeah, mine is not a question, but a an observation, having lived through the same period that Ernest Cole lived through, the camera was used by the system as a weapon of oppression. Mm -hmm. There was not one demonstration where the 16 millimeter camera was not put in your face. And as much as we were scared by the police dogs, we knew that those images were probably going to come and bite us in the ass later on. And I'm sure these images are still there. Mm -hmm. The system was very good at documenting things. And as we saw in searching for Sugarman, exactly. those archives are extensive. Yes. Very Great. good point. Okay. okay. So Angela, take it away on the first two, and then we'll see who wants mm -hmm. to answer this or respond mm -hmm. to the third. Okay, I'll try to be <laughs> succinct. Um, um, Obama did actually issue a proclamation on, I think, um, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think it was December 31st, yes, it, was. <laughs> it was, that we should uh, celebrate Emancipation Proclamation uh, 150th anniversary on January 1st. Mm -hmm. And most people were probably out partying when the proclamation came out uh, anyway. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the film Lincoln, um, uh, which doesn't deal with the Emancipation Proclamation, but it does deal with the 13th Amendment. Uh, and it, 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 it kind of um, overshadows the complexity of the Emancipation Proclamation, which was more a military strategy than anything else. Uh, and if you actually read that document, you discover that more attention is given to the exceptions uh, to those slaves that uh, were, would not be emancipated by this proclamation, namely in both the states and the regions uh, that remain loyal to uh, the Union. So it was okay to have slavery as long as your slavery was a part of the Union. That was basically the message of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, so um, it seems to me that uh, it would be very difficult now to have a full um, celebration and discussion of this Emancipation Proclamation without revealing uh, you know, what uh, was, was actually going on. Eric Fona's uh, uh, new book on Lincoln and American slavery uh, reveals some of the contradictions between what he sees as the historical record and what is the popular narrative about uh, Lincoln as the man who freed um, the slaves. Uh, 
Um, so now the second question. Uh, While you're thinking about that, Angela, <laughs> can I just add that I, I completely agree with you that it would require that whole conversation, but it struck me on December 31st when I saw that go by that Obama was being, and his people were being quite strategic in making sure that that a, a, an incitation to a very racist response to the celebration mm -hmm. did not occur. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that I, I, I'm not usually paranoid or conspiratorial in my analyses, but on this ca in this case, it seemed to me that Obama and, and, and that, that they precisely did not want to have a celebration that would also have a counter to it that was available, that is available in, in a, a racist and racial undertone in this country, especially on the eve of trying to get immigration reform. That was my analysis of why we buried it. And, um, but I also well, let's think, talk about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, on the other question. I mean, because, because it's okay. actually very interesting that Emancipation Day uh, was celebrated uh, uh, for several decades, and and Deborah Willis's uh, 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 book called "Envisioning Emancipation," you see these amazing celebrations of Absolutely. Emancipation Day. Uh, Absolutely. So yeah, it's 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 extremely complicated, but I think it also points to the fact that we have not really learned how to engage in a conversation about race. Uh, On either yeah. side, yes, exactly. that's right, that's right. Now, the second question about uh, black women's role in um, the, what, what we know as the civil rights movement, what people called at that time, the freedom movement. Uh, um, interestingly, um, Martin Berger also points out that there's a whole archive of lost images of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And many of those lost images are images of black women resisting, black women fighting back when they are attacked by the police uh, uh, in favor of the, the, the images of black men being attacked by the police and responding uh, with the, the kind of uh, um, uh, nonviolence that uh, was Strategic, of course. Uh, uh, now, the help. <laughs> help. <laughs> I think that would require a, a, a very long uh, <laughs> conversation. And let me say that uh, uh, there, were some, there were some very positive um, moments. Are you referring to the film or the, or the novel? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because actually I thought the film was better than the novel. Because I think that the, the actors in, in, in the film uh, asserted a kind of agency uh, that overshadowed, uh, for example, the, um, the kind of uh, dialect that was used in the, the novel that was very uh, troubling to me. Uh, so I found it much easier to, to watch the film than I did to read the, the novel. But thank you for making that connection. <laughs> Um, we have to close. I want to thank a few people, and I'm very sorry, but we, we must. Oh, but there was one last question that... Uh... Well, it was a comment. Oh, and look, there's all kinds of questions. Um, uh, David, do we have to close? <laughs> yeah, I, see, now I'm being policed. So now I, I, I'm afraid we do. So um, first, let me thank David. Theo Goldberg, David Marshall, and Marla Burns for producing this event in the first place. <laughs> Ernest Cole for being Ernest Cole. <laughs> Jean Kamaroff, Ken Gonzalez Day, and Angela Davis. And 
a really gorgeous set of questions and provocations and thoughts from all of you. So thank you.